Hi, everybody. I'm Mauricio on behalf of BJD Group from Brazil, and I'll share with you something we did in Colombia last year. In 2001, Juan Maecha was shot to death while he was parking his motorcycle in front of his girlfriend's house. Though he was not involved in any gang, his neighborhood mates were, they were fighting to control a drug selling area in the periphery of Medellin, Colombia. In the course of such gang disputes, new territories are drawn over the hills of Medellin, entrenching what usually were just blocks belonging to the same street. That's what they call the invisible borders. Juan got shot just because he trespassed one of these imaginary borders. But this is not Juan, this is Manuel, his older brother, who's helped us recount the story of this project. As a matter of fact, Juan is one of the uncountable names written on the wall at the back of a local church just for the sake of not falling into oblivion. Manuel, his brother, thought it absurd that for such a long time his brothers and mates have been killing each other in the name of he doesn't know what. Santo Domingo Savio, this neighborhood, or as they call it, Comuna, was born in the 60s when Colombians who escaped the countryside guerrilla or were forced to downgrade from the central areas began to raise their humble houses in the steepy green creeks of Medellin's North Oriental Valley. It remained a deprived area till the year of 2004 when the government decided to fight back narco-traffic and regain control over the ghettos. The, the foundation stone for the recovery was the implementation of the metro cable, an aerial means of transportation that connected the, the regular metro system to stations uphill. The package also included the construction of major cultural equipment, public electric stairways, and a tourist attraction, the RV Natural Park. This project was considered very successful since it preserved the original urban tissue almost intact. On the one hand, the rise of property value, tourism, and the control of an informal market have favored from small business entrepreneurs to landlords and public companies and their private part partners. On the other hand, the same valuation process resulted that many of its inhabitants could not live up to the upgrade standards and were forced to relocate to new informal settlements, usually located in risky areas and in constant threat of landslides, which was the case when I took this photo. So, this upgrade of informal settlements in Medellin attracted global Y. Cities like Caracas and more recently Rio de Janeiro have copied the same model of upgrading favelas. In any of these cases, what comes first is a, is a, a military intervention which consists on taking control of the former structures of power. In Brazil, these groups are called pacification police units. What happens is that in, in many cases they end up acting as a right-wing paramilitary counterpart to the former gangs, corrupting community and reenacting old forms of violence. And cities in emerging countries like Brazil are being shaped as commodities in the global market. And, and, and major events like the FIFA World Cup and the Olympic Games are triggered to this kind of transformation that go hand in hand with the interests of real estate speculation and the hegemonic sector. So last year, Bijari was invited to participate on MED11, an art event dedicated to investigate knowledge transmission in art practice. The project I will share to you aiming at dealing with the shift in the subjective and physical tissue of this community by recounting the stories of those who live within invisible borders. So, we posed some starting questions. The first was, what is valuable to be, to be remembered? What should be kept in secret? Does silence mean a trauma that inhabits us, that inhabit our ability to, to imagine, create, and express? How to, how to engage in a specific relation with the community and not appropriate or just document this story. How to think about form in terms of the form of engaging in a dialogue to design the process of transmission. So the first decision was to appropriate the cable as a platform as drifting of the, over the Comunas favela was in itself an aesthetic experience. The second decision was to handcraft what we call the box of stories and secrets. This device reflected our concern about providing the situation of this dialogue. It was roughly built out of a PET bottle attached to a note box with a recorder inside. It also appropriated the symbolism of the shoe boxes where we used to archive 
effective souvenirs like letters and photographs. The box as a container of one's memory. So let's get back to Manuel. This guy had a very good geographical and physical understanding of the area for his uh, community leader besides being an art educator. We hired Manuel with whom we have been climbing up and down the hills of Medellin, knocking on doors, interviewing people. Who are you? Where did you come from? Where do you go to? What binds you to this place? What makes you worry or dream about? Some of them were happy because the upgrade of the favela reflected their very own upgrading. Old ladies remember how they first settled when there were only green hills. Some boys expressed anguish for they have relatives and friends threatened during violent times. An old lady complained how she's been constantly pressed to sell her lot to the real estate company in charge of building formal dwellings. An old guy complained how he could afford the formal bus transportation mode, but he cannot afford any more the expensive cable car ticket. In general, women express a strong fe feeling of empowerment and emancipation for being the family holders in a society whose rates of homicide are dramatically high among men, and so on and so forth. So the process of listening to these testimonies was like ex excavating over a matrix of intimate testimonies that should be transposed to acquire a collective voice to resonate over the suburban landscape. The phrases resulting from the edition were painted on large, 16 large pieces of cloth. They were installed over the rooftops lying below, below the metro cable's path. They could be read alone or in a sequence for they are synthetically articulated along the car trajectory. So to conclude, in the process of outlining the dreams and conflicts submerged in this anonymity, the gesture he undertaking not only looks to confront hegemonic stories, but also points to the need to reframe power, power relations in respect to the production of spaces and subjectivities. We understand the whole of art as the need to fill the gap between the visible and the invisible, representation and lived experience. We set this intervention to unleash forms of symbolic description that can put in question and even forms of urban development and rethink our rel relation between our daily life and our political beings. Manuel referred to his art, as, his art practice and how he could emancipate in the context of violence by understanding under which forms of social and unconscious and unconscious repression he was living under. From this micro-political perspective, he envisioned ways to overcome the so-called invisible border so he could help redrawing new cartographies from which build a better neighborhood. Thank you.